No, don't change the key. I can sing that part and you can sing a lower harmony. Which part? Oh, no, no, there's one on each one. <laughs> Hold on, I'm trying to sing that one. Good morning, Village. It is so good to see y'all. Um, real quick, I know this is annoying, just bear with me. Derek, could I get a little bit more of this microphone up here so I don't end up screaming at the people? Unless, like, you know, I decide to scream at the people. Okay. It is so good to see y'all. I'm so excited. I have that, like, nervous excitement or excited nervousness. I don't know, but I'm so excited. I'm always excited to be at the Village. Um, but today is super duper special. For one thing, there are so many faces here. I feel like sometimes we're on like a rotation of like who you're going to see at the village. And today is one of those days where like we see so many people and it's so good. And whether you're here in Hateful or out there uh, on Facebook land eating your bacon and eggs and your jammies, um, it is so good to just share space with you. Um, so today's going to be a good day. Shane Claiborne is here, and we're so excited about that. I'm excited about that. Pastor Ray's going to talk a little bit more about Shane and what today is going to look like. But for right now, can we just sort of become present here? I don't know about y'all, but Sunday mornings are kind of like a hustle-bustle thing sometimes for me. And so I just need a breath to kind of come into the moment Come into my body, come into the sanctuary right here, right here. So I just want to remind you, if you've been with me before, or let you know if you haven't, whatever, however it is that you become present in this moment, however it is that you can really connect as we sing and as we pray and as we contemplate and just um, bring our whole selves into this moment, however it is that you do that, whether it's standing up, or sitting down, or laying on the floor, or taking you a lap around the church. You're not going to bother me or scare me one bit. So you just, you just get into the moment. You just get in 
to that place where you just, you're open, you're listening, your ears are open. God, Spirit, our ears are open this morning. Our hearts are open this morning. Our hands are open this morning. We say, come Holy Spirit, come and speak, come. We are listening. Here is my heart, Lord. I'm listening. Could you just say that with me this morning? Here's my heart, Lord. I'm listening. Here's my heart, Lord. I'm listening. One more time, a deep breath. Here's my heart, Lord. I'm listening. Love is what has brought us here With the courage to come near Chase away our pride and our fear
Chase away with me. Chase away our pride and our fear. With the light to carry it. With the light to carry I'm going to ask you to join me in what's sometimes the most, one of the most dangerous prayers we can pray, dangerous to our ego, not dangerous to our heart, dangerous to our egos, dangerous to our perception, dangerous to our prejudice. Dangerous to our comfort. I'm just going to ask you to go out on a limb with me this morning and pray. It's a spirit break out. Sing this together, spirit. Spirit break out. Break our walls down. Break our walls down. Spirit break out, heaven come down, heaven come down, say that again, spirit, spirit break out, break our walls, break our walls down, oh spirit, spirit break out, heaven come down. Heaven come down Our Father All of heaven rolls your name Sing louder Let this place hear Glory. 
spirit break out Break our walls down Walls of fear Yeah, spirit Spirit break out Heaven come down Come down Heaven come down Spirit break out Break every wall Walls of shame Spirit break out. Oh, heaven come down. Heaven come down. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain. step you take brings justice there is a life in every word you ever said oh Jesus there is healing in your touch you trade beauty for Pain. With just one word, you rise above the wind and waves, oh Jesus. Sing this with us. Jesus, Jesus, you have freed us. You broke the curse of sin. Jesus, Jesus, you redeem us, you call us out of the grave today. You call us out of the grave.
There is wisdom when it's dark. Your holy fire it lights the way. You stand in tomorrow. Get a witness. Yeah, oh, and there is victory for your church. Oh, the light cannot be overwhelmed. Not even death can quench our hope for days to come. Oh, Jesus. Don't want to have feet of stone. I don't want to have feet of stone. Want to follow this river of life wherever it has me go. I don't want to have feet of stone. Don't want to have a dagger tongue. I don't want to have a dagger tongue. I want my words to be a weapon, but a healing ball. I don't want to have a dagger. 
Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? God, we thank you. We thank you for this moment, this opportunity to sing and think about words. Maybe we've not thought about all week, but we see these words and we hear the melody and we sing these words and we say, how wonderful would that be if we really had eyes to see, if we really had a heart that was attuned. God, we believe that's going to happen. We believe that you are working in us and things are changing in us and our lives are growing closer to the best lives that you've always intended. Teach us this day. Help us. Help us see. In Christ's name, amen. Well, Deborah Lynn, did you enjoy the worship music this morning? I absolutely loved it. She is one of my all-time favorite worship leaders and for those who maybe are visiting with us, she lives in North Carolina, but once a month she leads our worship here. For that, we're very grateful. She and Valerie come down, and we're so happy that you do. Welcome, everybody. We have uh, some guests here. We just want you to know we are honored above anything you could even imagine that you have chosen to come today and hang out with us and uh, experience this unusual church, and uh, thank you for being here. We hope that you'll leave saying that was a really wonderful experience. And uh, we maybe sensed God, God's presence, and that would be the most wonderful thing in the world. We would love that. I want to welcome people online for uh, the Village Church and Everybody Church all over the nation. Thank you for watching. And now I want to just take a brief moment to say if you'd like to support the ministry that's happening here, no pressure, no pressure at all, but you can do that by just using the QR code. You can just shoot your phone up there and take a picture of that. That's one way to do it. Or if you'd prefer the old-fashioned way and dropping some coins in a bucket or a dollar in the bucket or even uh, swiping your card through a machine, we have someone in the back by that door right there who can help you in the quietness if you wanted to just walk back there or at the end of the service if you just wanted to go back there, then someone would help you with your gift. So thank you. That's all I want to say about that. Thank you for that. And I want to move into how excited I am about our speaker today. And I'd let you know that we're going to have the first session, and then we're, we have lunch for all of you. We have a wonderful sandwich lunch, and what we're going to do is dismiss long enough for you to walk back there and get a sandwich, come back to your table and eat, and then there's a second session. And we really hope that you can be a part of that because we think it's going to be really meaningful. Now, let me introduce our speaker. Forty years ago, I was just getting started in ministry, and there was a man named Tony Campolo, Dr. Tony Campolo, who had a huge influence on my life. I didn't necessarily follow the things he said to do in my actions, but it sure stirred in me that following Jesus meant actually kind of walking like Jesus and caring about the things Jesus cared about and, and living the way Jesus lived. He actually spoke at our church 15, 16 years ago, and that was a wonderful honor to us. Well, about 25 years ago, I began to hear about a young man 
that was much like Tony, except he was in his young 20s, and he was walking like Jesus, and he cared for things the way Jesus cared about things. And often, it was exactly opposite the way the church was perceiving things, or maybe the church was acting, but something inside of me said, he's doing it right. He's thinking about these things right. Three or four years ago, Jane and I were at a festival in North Carolina, Hot Springs, North Carolina, and we had the opportunity to hear Shane Claiborne speak for the first time. It was in a big, huge tent, and the tent was packed. In fact, people were outside, spilling outside, listening, and Jane and I were sitting and listening to him talk about things we had never heard in church, and yet it felt as if Jesus was just exploding in our hearts. Then he began to talk about gun violence, and I saw my wife, tears streaming down my wife's face and beginning to drip on the table, just like the table that you're sitting at. When it was over, everybody cleared the, the tent, and Jane and I stayed, and we just began to talk about it and process what we were feeling, and she talked about how her heart just had been touched in a deep way, and she said, I wonder if we could ever get Shane to come to the village church. I said, I will try. About three hours later that day, Jane and I bumped into Shane Claiborne, and we told him the story. Jane told him the story about how her family was impacted by gun violence 25 years ago, and we're standing in the middle of this campground, and she's crying, and Shane is just listening so intently, and we said, would you ever come to the village? And he said, I would love to come to the village. COVID happened, took us a little time to get him here but I am so honored. And let me say this. He's going to do something in the second session that's going to directly involve the things Jane was talking about concerning her family and gun violence 25 years ago. And I urge you to be here because it is a very meaningful thing. It is meaningful to Jane. It's meaningful to her mom. And I have a hunch it will be meaningful to many of you. So please know if you can stay, we'd love for you to stay. Without further ado, would you welcome Shane Claiborne. I've heard about you people at the village, and I'm so glad that the, the time came that we could be together. I'm so glad to be with you, Deborah Lynn, and worship with you. Uh, you teed me up. Well, Pastor Ray, to tell a story from my friend Tony Campolo that he told me years ago, uh, and I think it sets us up well. Tony told me this story. He said, this is a true story. You never really know with Tony, though, but I took him for his word. And he said, um, there's a guy living on the streets that came to worship on Sunday morning, and he chose the fancy, big, kind of mega church thing downtown, and he strolled in, just had his bags with him, and he was living on the streets, so didn't have anywhere to stash it, sat down to worship Jesus. And the pastor said to him, uh, listen, sir, I don't know if you've been here before, but this is a sanctuary. This is the, a holy space, the house of God. And I want you to do something. You can stay today, but I want you to ask God what you should look like when you come to church, what you should wear. The guy stayed in worship, but he just sort of left, you know, awkwardly obviously after experiencing that but he didn't know where, where else to go so the next week he came back mostly because he just wanted to worship Jesus and he sat down again up front and the pastor saw him before the service and he you know he was the same as he had come last week wearing the same clothes had his bags with him the pastor said sir I recognize you we talked last week and I told you you need to ask God what you should wear when you come to church did you ask God and uh, the guy said yeah pastor I did and God said he didn't know because he's never been to your church. I kind of like that one a little bit, you know. Uh, kind of reminds us that we're good at excluding the very people that were magnetized to Jesus, right? And we, uh, we sometimes in the church have become more known for who we've excluded than the grace and mercy that we've included people in it. Breaks my heart sometimes, but I, I keep falling deeper in love with Jesus, and that uh, causes me to want to live out a, a better narrative of what it means to be church. And that's why I'm so glad to be here with y'all today. I, I grew up in the Bible Belt in East Tennessee, 
case you can't tell, you know, and uh, actually, I was just home hanging out with my mom, Deborah Lynn, and uh, my uncle was telling me my, <laughs> my, my family are on the Moonshiner show, you know, I didn't know that until now, there's a Moonshiner show, and they uh, I'm related to those folks. It's no surprise now, and I can neither confirm nor deny that my uncle may be brewing moonshine. But my, my folks are buried in the mountains. You know, I grew up in the hills. I, I fell in love with Jesus there. And, but I started to see some of those contradictions, you know, in the church. I, I can remember um, as I fell in love with Jesus, I... I remember Tony saying, you know, we got that hymn, Just As I Am. And he said, sometimes you see a pattern in the church that we come to the altar singing Just As I Am, and we leave just as we were, and we keep living just like we always had. You know, it doesn't always, we, we begin to kind of focus on the things that we believe. But Christianity isn't just a way of believing. Right? It's a way of living in the world. And I, I found that the church was better at making believers than forming disciples, right? And you can worship Jesus without doing the stuff He said. And in the end, I look at Scripture and it says, we can have faith to move mountains and speak in the tongues of men and of angels and do all sorts of miracles and prophecies and fathom all the depths of knowledge. But if we don't have love, it's empty. If we don't have love, we still are falling short of what we're called to be. And, and I think uh, what, what began to concern me is uh, you see that the church, is as, as we have all of these beliefs, we aren't always known by the way that we love. When you ask folks what do Christians believe, they can tell you all the stuff, but when you say, how do Christians live? That's where we got a little bit of an image problem in the world, right? I can remember the Barna Research Group, you know, this kind of mega polling and research company. They went all over the U.S. and they asked young non-Christians, what do you think of when you hear the word Christian? What they found was heartbreaking. The number one answer of what young non-Christians said when they hear the word Christian is that they think anti-gay. Anti-homosexual. Number two was that Christians are judgmental. And number three is that uh, Christians are uh, arrogant, um, that we're self-righteous. It kept going that list, you know, that we were... Uh, uh, and what broke my heart as I read this list of what young non-Christians think of when they hear the word Christian, what broke my heart was... What didn't even register on the poll is the thing that Jesus said, they will know that you are mine by your... I'm so glad you knew the answer to that. It could have been awkward. Some churches don't know the answer to that. You know, they will know that we are Christians by our love. I heard someone once say that, uh, that, that, that we, we um, spread the gospel best not by force but by fascination. That we, we, we are meant to live in a way that fascinates people with the love of God. That they might say, uh, look at how those people love each other. So as I kind of went on the journey to figure out what does it really look like to live out a better version of Christianity, I kept reading about all the saints, you know, all these wonderful folks like St. Francis of Assisi and all these people that they fascinated me with the way that they lived out their faith, but most of them were passed on to the other side, right? Except for Mother Teresa, who was still alive when we were in college in Philadelphia. That's why I went up to Philly, was to go to college, and my college friends and I are sitting around, we're going, man, if there was somebody that's taken the Sermon on the Mount seriously, it seems like Mother Teresa. She's given us a pretty good go, you know? And we, heard, we had read about what she's doing in India, and so we wrote her a letter and we didn't know, you know, if we would hear back. We prayed over that letter, old school, snail mail. You know, we just sent that thing off. And every day I would go to the mailbox hoping I had a return letter Mother Teresa had written me. And I never got that letter. But we were stubborn and 20 years old. And no one's convinced us anything's impossible. So we just started calling nuns on the phone and said, listen, we're trying to get a hold of Mother Teresa because we want to learn how to follow Jesus and uh, most of the nuns hung up on us, thought it was prank call. But this one nun, I kid you not, uh, she said, 
well, hold on a minute. Let me see if I got a number. She gave me a number for India, for, for uh, the, uh, like missionaries of charity, and she said, give that a try. So I called, and we didn't have a cell phone or anything. This is like 1995, back in the 1900s. You know, we had a pay phone. Young people, these were things that you put quarters in, and you could call, right? And we called, and it was like $3 a minute, so the quarters are going fast, and we call India. I did my research, so we called it about midnight, so it would be the middle of the day in India, and uh, the phone starts to ring, and I'm kind of expecting a polite receptionist, you know, missionaries of charity, how can we help you, or something like that, and I just hear, hello! I'm like, I got the wrong number, and it's $3 a minute. And I started talking fast. I said, we're trying to get a hold of Mother Teresa and the missionaries of charity, someone in India, because we're uh, calling from the United States, and we're trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. We want to come work over there. And she goes, well, this is Mother Teresa. And, and I'm like, and I'm the Pope. You know, like, uh, I, I start tell. I said, it really is, sure enough. And, and my friends are all sitting there praying, you know. And I said, well, we want to come uh, work in India with you. And she says, well, come on. I'm like, go. Uh, and I start thinking real reasonably. You know, where are we going to sleep? What are we going to eat? And so I ask her, you know, where would we stay? You, you got a futon or something? You know, and Mother Teresa says, God takes care of the lilies and the sparrows. Don't worry about all that. You just find your way over here. I'm like, awesome. I hope it works when I tell my mom you said that. You know, and uh, and we we went, though, and we you know, live this adventure. I mean, the things I had just read about and seen pictures of in books. We we worked in the I worked in the home for the dying every day. Mother Teresa's first home that she started, where we re, you know we went out into the streets and we would pull people in who were dying without anybody holding their hand. And uh, you know, the sisters taught us. They said our our goal is not necessarily to keep someone alive. We'll we'll try to do that, but our goal is for them. To live or die feeling the love of God. Feeling someone whispering to them how precious they are. Uh, dying, uh, laughing a little bit because somebody's told them a joke. So you hold their hand, you share food with them. And every day that's what we did. And when you go, uh, every day folks would die. If they got better, they went to the home for the sick. But this was the home for the dying. And when we carried the bodies into the morgue uh, that was right there, it said on the wall, I'm on my way to heaven. And when he turned around, it said, thanks for helping me get there. Uh, my friend said it felt like we were travel agents, right? From this world to the next, we were just helping people with the transition. But it's there that we learned, you know, uh, what Mother Teresa meant when she said, what we're called to do is not great things, but small things with great love. What's important isn't how much you do but how much love you put into doing it. So we're every day looking into the eyes of people and we're praying that they would feel the love of God uh, through our hands, through our words, through our listening ears, right? And I learned to pray in India. I mean, we got up at the crack of dawn. It was 5 o'clock in the morning when we got up to pray. I don't know about you, but that is not my prime hour. But I got up and I would go in to pray we took off all our shoes outside the door, and you'd go in barefoot and kneel before the cross. And I, I began to realize, I mean, we spent quite a bit of time in silence, and then we would pray these prayers. And it was very different from how I w grew up. You know, in youth group, we would take prayer requests, right? And it was kind of like you'd rattle off all the things you, 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 know, you, know, you needed from God or wanted from God and who was sick. And I think that's a part of prayer. But if we're not careful... It's like my friend's kid, he, he, he was going up to pray, he said, I'm going up to pray, does anybody need anything? You know, you can end up sort of like your Santa list or something, and there's a part of prayer that's not just about us trying to get what we want from God, but it's us trying to get ourselves to be transformed by God so that we can become that presence of God's love in the world. And uh, I, uh, th this is one of the prayers we prayed every morning in Calcutta. It said, may every person I come in contact with. Feel your presence in my soul, Jesus. May I leave off your fragrance everywhere I go, Jesus. May I leave off the scent of your love. And 
And then I also realized this is why we took communion. Every single morning, Mother Teresa insisted that we would all take the Eucharist, uh, do communion together. And, you know, as a Methodist growing up, that felt a little redundant. We did it once a month, not every morning, you know. And I was asking one of the nuns, I said, listen, uh, how do we do communion every morning? And she said, well, you've heard that old saying, you are what you eat. She's like, that's pretty much it. That's what we're going for. I mean, we really believe that, right? That there's a mystery to communion and, and the Eucharist, that we are, are be, being transformed by it. We are becoming what we eat. We're becoming uh, the hands and the feet of Jesus alive in the world that we might be able to say with Paul, the life I live, I no longer live, but Jesus lives in me. That's what we're going for, right? So that was, I mean, there's so many things I learned in India. Um, but one of the best things was that you don't have to go to India to learn how to follow Jesus. You know, Mother Teresa, she had a beautiful line. She said, she would send people out with it. She said, Calcuttas are everywhere if we'll only have eyes to see. So pray that God would give you the eyes to see the folks who are hurting, the folks that uh, are, are lonely and ostracized right where you are. So we came back to Philly with that kind of, prayer in our soul and we were 20 years old we pulled our money together and we were inspired by the early church in the book of acts right i'm gonna show you a few pictures after lunch because i heard you had this led screen and uh so i'm gonna use it i got some pictures of philly i'll show you after lunch but we pulled our money together we were inspired by uh how in the book of acts it says they shared everything they had no one claimed any of their possessions with their own so we pulled our money together we bought a little row house and we've been building this little village and our goal, I mean, even above our door are those words, let's do small things with great love today. And so we started doing that. And how many of y'all know, though, that once you do the work of charity and compassion, it kind of leads you to the work of justice, right? Because uh, I, I remember uh, hearing, you know, uh, someone say, uh, after you give people food so long, you start to ask why people are hungry, right? Uh, I remember Martin Luther King saying, we're called to lift our neighbor out of the ditch like that person on the road to Jericho. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say, maybe we need to rethink the whole road to Jericho so people don't keep ending up in the ditch. So we started doing that work of justice in our neighborhood, trying to address uh, why, folk, why there's such inequity in the world, right? Why, uh, I mean, after you lift... You see, so you hold so many mama's hands after they've lost their babies to guns, you start to say, where are these kids getting the guns, right? We started to ask those deeper questions. And one of them, one of the things that we saw in Philadelphia was some terrible laws that were discriminating and targeting our most vulnerable citizens of Philadelphia, the anti-homeless laws. Y'all had some of them in Atlanta. The laws that passed in Philadelphia, by the way, Philadelphia means city of love, right? So... And we've got Love Park with that iconic love sign, you know. So we, we said, uh, we got to challenge these laws. The laws that passed made it illegal to sleep in public. They made it illegal uh, to ask for spare change on the streets. One of the final laws made it illegal to give out food. It was literally illegal to take a pizza downtown and give it out. So we said, we got to challenge those laws, but we want to do it in the right spirit. You know, we want to do it with humility in our hearts. And so we had a worship service where we brought our guitars and our drums and we served communion, which was tricky because you're not allowed to give out food, you know. And the cops were like, you can't arrest them during communion. That's, that ain't right. In fact, I think I need to take communion, you know. And, and uh, after the communion, we kept breaking the bread by bringing in some pizzas and stuff, you know. And... Um, that was kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. We, we slept out in solidarity with our friends from time to time to challenge the hours that were put on public space. And then one night out of nowhere, about 50 of us were in the park, and the police surrounded the park, and they arrested all of us. And we were handcuffed, t taken to jail, charged with all kinds of stuff. Uh, and my mom was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is not how I raised you, son. But we fought our way in court. And uh, this is why it's also funny to me when I meet Christians sometimes that 
you know, have this testimony that they, their life was such a mess. You know, they did all this stuff. They did drugs. They went to jail and all this. And then they met Jesus and everything came together. And if that's your story, God bless you. I mean, we all got our story. But mine's a little different. Like, I, I pretty much have my life together. And I met, I met Jesus and he messed me up. You know, I mean, it was not before I became a Christian I went to jail. But uh, because I was a Christian that I ended up going to jail. And, and we kept doing it. We kept feeding people. Crazy, right? And we got fined, and we went to jail, and we were finally drugged before the court, and about 30 of us were on trial. We decided, instead of just our big lawyers, we wanted our lawyers there to help us, but we decided that we wanted one of the guys that lived this struggle firsthand to represent us. So our buddy Alfonso, who we all knew as Fonz, because he's smooth, you know, we're like, he's perfect person to represent us in court, so... Uh, you know, as we go to trial, I had a shirt on that said, Jesus was homeless. And the judge goes, come here. Jesus was homeless. Tell me about that. And I said, yeah, your honor, in the scripture, Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. Uh, Jesus was homeless. And the judge goes, you guys might stand a chance. And we did. You know, as we fought our case in court, Fonzo stood up to represent us all. And Fonz said, your honor. On behalf of the group, I'd like to say we believe that these laws the city is passing are wrong and evil. And we rest our case. <laughs> we're all like, amen. And the district attorney, uh, you know, the prosecutors, they were not impressed by this. They, were, uh, they said, these guys are hard criminals. They need to go to jail. They need to pay fines. And this is a big one. They go, and they need hours and hours of court-sanctioned mandatory community service. Like, no, don't make us. Work in a soup kitchen or something. You know, so anyway, we, uh, we, we fight our case, and the judge interrupts the whole court scene, and he says, listen, you don't have to convince me these people broke the law. It's crystal clear they've been breaking the law over and over and over. But what, what's in question here is the constitutionality and the rightness, the morality of the laws that were passing in this city. And he said, if it weren't for people who broke the bad laws, we wouldn't have the, the, the freedom that we have. That's what this country's built on, from the Boston Tea Party to the Civil Rights Movement. And he said, these guys are not criminals. They're freedom fighters. And I find them all not guilty on every charge. Dropped all our charges that day. And then he said, and how can I get one of those shirts? And so I... I gave him a shirt later, and uh, but that was my introduction right into the holy mischief, the good trouble that John Lewis talks about, and and I think we need some of that good trouble today, right? That that uh, I, I love how the great French thinker Jacques Ellul said, uh, "I don't know where we get the notion that Christians are just meant to be good." Uh, law-abiding citizens and defenders of the status quo. Jacques Ellul said, Christians at their best have been oh, holy troublemakers, people who stir things up, who refuse to accept the world as it is and insist on building the world that God wants. And, and so that's why we end up, you look at the prophets, they go to jail, they get in trouble. Even our Savior, right, ruffled some feathers. You, you look at the gospel and those patterns, I mean, we began to see all kinds of that little holy mystery. In fact, here in Atlanta, you know, there, was a, there were laws that were making it difficult for folks on the street. And uh, I remember some of our friends at the open door community, some of y'all might remember that on uh, Ponce de Leon or down here is Ponce de Leon, I think, you know, on, on that street where they, they had uh, so much love for folks on the street. And they said, in, in, in Atlanta, uh, a lot of folks were getting pushed around too. And they were getting harassed by the police. Sometimes there were even cases where folks on the street were charged with a sex crime because they were using the bathroom in an alleyway or behind a dumpster. It ruined the rest of their life because they couldn't find a bathroom. And they said, so we had a campaign called Pee for Free with Dignity. And they <laughs> marched with toilets to the city hall building and say, yeah, you can't tell people you can't use the restroom unless we have restrooms, right? And, and uh, like public bathrooms. And so all over this country, I think even now, there are folks that are uh, trying to reimagine the world, right? And our country's experiencing some growing pains. <laughs> Lord, that's an understatement. But like, I, I mean, in my home state of Tennessee, they just made it a felony to sleep in public. It's not just folks on the street, right? But some of our laws and our policies. And you look at Jesus. 
And this is where I love Jesus is saying what matters most is how we treat the most vulnerable people in the world. You know, Jesus' final account of the judgment, Matthew 25, when all of us are gathered before God, Jesus says we're going to be given an account of our lives. We're going to be asked a few questions by God. And according to Jesus, it's not just a doctrinal test, right? It's not that God's going to go, okay, virgin birth, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree, right? We might wish that it was a theology test. Uh, we would probably pass the theology test. But the questions we're going to be asked are, when I was hungry, did you give me something to eat, right? Did, when I was a stranger, did you welcome me in? When I was an immigrant, a refugee, did you welcome me? Did you, did you give me health care when I needed it? Uh, did you visit me when I was in prison? And the true test of our faith is how it affects the most vulnerable people in our society. Oh, I mean, God cares not how the Dow Jones is doing, but how the least of these are doing, right? And if our faith is not about welcoming the homeless and the refugees and the immigrants, then we dare not call it Christianity because it doesn't look like Jesus, right? It doesn't smell like Jesus. If our faith is not about peacemaking and turning guns into garden tools and beating swords into plows and turning broken hearts into wholeness. If, if our work is not healing the world, and it's not the work of Jesus. In our community, we, we get a lot of donated food. Pastor Ray, you know, you want to, before you eat like some donated food, you don't want to just die right in. You need to, it needs to pass the sniff test. You know what I'm saying? Especially the dairy. You know, like you, it's got to pass the sniff test. And so you, you, you get donated uh, yogurt, and before you just eat it, you want to smell it. And I think that there is the same as kind of true of Christianity. Uh, that there are lots of things that are, uh, that are trying to call themselves Christianity, but if it doesn't smell like Jesus, right? If it doesn't pass the sniff test, if it doesn't love like Jesus, then it's not Christianity. And that's why I love when I look at Jesus you get the sense that they're, they're going to know that we are Christians not by our bumper stickers, not by our t-shirts, not by our yard signs, but by our love. And that's the greatest thing that we can do with our faith is try to love the world like Jesus loved it, to whisper Jesus' love to a broken world. And so I am so grateful to be here at the village because I think you're working out that love together, right? And, and we need communities where you can see the love, you can feel the love. Uh, and in the end, I am so hopeful that a generation from now, when people hear the word Christian, they won't say anti-gay, judgmental, hypocritical, but they will say love. They will say love. May it be so. Let me pray for us. Oh God, thank you for this Sunday morning where we can worship you with Deborah Lynn, where we can pray that you would transform our hearts so that we act and love more like you. Forgive us for when we fall short. I pray you'd continue to shape and form this community at the village so that they are a demonstration plot of your kingdom so that people can see your love with skin on. Jesus, thank you for showing us what love looks like in the flesh. And if there's anyone here who has maybe got some scars and some bruises and some pain from what they've seen in the church, we pray that through all of the noise 
of hatred and judgmentalism that they would hear the whisper of your love. That mercy triumphs over judgment. That you came not for the righteous, but for the broken. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom be within us. Amen. Shane Claiborne. The time flies when he's talking. When he's talking, it's just like my heart is beating fast and it feels like it's growing. And then he stops. And I think, man, he stopped. So here's the deal, y'all. We are going to, we are going to break long enough to get a sandwich and come right back. I know some people have to leave, and I hate it for y'all. I really do, but I know some of you might have to leave. The rest of you, please come back, sit around tables, eat, talk amongst yourselves, get to know some people, and then as soon as we see people almost done with the sandwich, we're going to say, Shane, come back. And the second part, he's going to talk about gun violence. He's going to talk about what is happening in people's lives. He's going to talk about Jane and her mom's story. And uh, it's going to be unbelievable. You're going to want to be here. I am so proud. I want, to, I want Shane back again and again and again. I want to be on that mission to walk and talk like Jesus. And Marnie, Shane, I, don't, I told you this last night. Marnie went and served at that same mission, and I hope you all got connected. So that is so awesome. You guys are the very best. Take your time. Jane and the people will be in the back with the sandwiches and the drinks. And blessings to everybody. You're just, oh, let me say something real quick. We do something, and this is, sounds weird, but several times a year around long weekends, we say to people, um, go do something different. Sometimes we have done things like go on uh, feed, going on to try to feed the people downtown. Sometimes we just say, spend the weekend doing something fun, go to the lake, do something different. Next week is Labor Day weekend, and next week we won't have a service at 11 o'clock. You have a break. And then we come back the next Sunday, and we are so excited. We're finishing a series on leveraging our privilege, and it's going to be a wonderful service, but it's not next week. Blessings to everybody. Enjoy lunch, okay? Testing. Hey, everybody, I forgot to let you know Shane's got a table over here with books. Stop by the table, okay? To please, over here and see his book.
Listen to understand. What was it that made you come back and give both your life another chance? Do you know what he told me? He said, if you listen, you love me, speak, and you just listen.
How's lunch? Good? Alright, I love sandwiches, you know. I'm a sandwich enthusiast. Alright, well, y'all keep eating if you're not done. We're gonna kinda focus back in. Shane's coming back. So get comfy. Consider turning your chairs. Hope the lunch was good. You enjoy it. Everything's good. If anybody wanted to move a little closer, we do have a few seats you can fill in. We'd love that. Glad you're back. And Shane is going to jump up here and do just what he did the first half, talk to us about some other stuff. I've had people wanting to know, can we get a group together and go get arrested? And I like that. It's like we're going we're gonna to be putting our heads together and see how that works. Um, my dad will be chairing that group. I think he's excited about that too. But um, super glad you're here. I just wanted to... Just as a way of introduction before Shane comes to speak, so many people have been touched by gun violence, and uh, my family has been touched by gun violence. I remember Jane and I had been dating for a few months, and she, uh, one night, she just began to share with me that 25 years ago, her brother, who was a wonderful human being, wonderful, and her nephew, wonderful human being, somehow... A spat started. Some, we don't know exactly what happened. We don't know what it was. But there were guns in the house. And in a moment, two shots were fired. And my wife's only brother and her only nephew and my sweet mother-in-law's only son and only grandson were dead. And the journal did an editorial that said, when you say it with bullets... You can't take it back. And that's a true thing. So Shane, along with the other things that he talks about, talks about this crazy gun violence that uh, is just in our country. I've, there are people here, I know people here who have experienced, we have a gentleman here, a good friend of mine, just met him a few weeks ago, but he's, he's been shot twice. Been shot twice. Another friend of mine here, has had two family members who've committed suicide by gun. He's here. So Shane's going to talk about a bunch of other stuff, but I know that's going to be a part of it, and I know it's going to touch you, so you, I'm glad you stayed. And let me say one other thing. I have found the most spiritual people I have met have a seriousness about life and their issues in life that affects the least of these but they also have a lightness about them that says they're, they're joy-filled. And from the moment I talked to Shane on the phone a couple of days ago until this moment, I have felt that from him. He's serious about things that are, need to be taken seriously, and he wants to live the life of Jesus. But there is a levity or lightness that uh, is a part of him. So 
Let's welcome him one more time. Shane Claiborne. Thank you, sir. Well, I, I know that was a lot to take in, the, the tragic story that we, we heard and the folks that are impacted, you know, here this morning. And um, I want to say that, you know, at the center of our faith is this paradox of death and life, right? The executed and risen Savior, the battle between violence and love. And uh, it, the, the statistic right now is that about half of Americans know somebody who's been impacted by gun violence. Half of us um, have lost someone we love or had someone that has been taking their own life. Uh, so there's too many of those stories. Even this week in Philadelphia, I was setting up our shop, Ray, to where we're going to be turning guns into garden tools. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But uh, literally one hour I'm setting up our shop and our chop saws like this one here.